1,700 acre secluded redwood grove, leaders from around the world, prime ministers, chancellors, presidents, governors, again, the heads of industry, banking, academia, the media, Hollywood, only a select few, a little over 2,000 people, travel there to engage in bizarre, ancient, Canaanite, Luciferian, Babylon, mystery religion ceremonies. And uh, I successfully infiltrated through the Secret Service, uh, through the guards, through the Sonoma County Sheriff's Department. We were inside four hours. That's only one day out of the two weeks that they meet there for the admitted Summer Fire Festival of the Bohemian Club. So shall we burn thee once again this night, flames that keep thine energy. We shall read the sign. This summer sets us free. He shall burn me once again. Come <laughs> out with these flames, which hither ye have brought from regions where I reign. Ye fools and priests, I spit upon your fire! Wow. Great sense of all mortal wisdom. How of Bohemia, we beseech thee, grant us thy counsel. Great owl of Bohemia, Thank thee for thy adjuration. Begone, don't care. Fire shall have its will of thee. Begone, don't care. And all the winds, victory with thy dust. Hail, fellowships, eternal flame. Once again, this summer sets us free. <laughs> Dora the Explorer is an educational animated series on Nickelodeon. It follows seven-year-old Dora, who is always on an adventure, alongside her monkey, Boots, and her purple backpack. Dora seems like the most innocent of characters, big brown eyes and always with a smile on her face, always trying to solve puzzles or go on quests. But is she innocent? Or does this series have a deep dark secret? Some people say so. Specifically, those who reverse the Dora the Explorer theme song. Some insist that, played backwards, the song is sending the secret message, Hail Satan. Of course, this is not the first time satanic messages have been discovered in songs. When played backwards, a number of bands have been accused of hiding satanic messages in the reversal of their music, but very few children's shows have been accused of it. Dora's kind of on a blacklist all her own. Do you think there's a hidden message in this mumbo jumbo? Listen and judge for yourself. I'm on the fence with this one. <laughs> Number 3. Gravity Falls Cryptograms Gravity Falls is a newer Disney cartoon TV series which premiered in June 2012. The series is about 12-year-old twins, Dipper and Mabel Pines, who are summer vacationing with their great uncle, Grunkle Stan. Stan runs the mystery shack in Gravity Falls and they help their uncle run it. They also uncover some mysteries. Mysteries that are often accompanied by the paranormal and the supernatural. At some point, Dipper finds a journal in the forest. This journal has clues to a local mystery which they must investigate. Their friends join in the unraveling of said mysteries. The best part about the show is that during the episode credits, a cryptogram appears. The viewers then can join in cracking the Gravity Falls code. Series of episodes use different cryptograms. Episodes 1 through 6, for instance, use the Caesar cipher, named after Julius Caesar, who applied it in his written communications. 
The Caesar cipher replaces letters with different letters, a fixed number of spots further along it in the alphabet. For example, it might shift left four letters so that letter L of the secret message would become H in the cipher text. Gravity Falls kicks it up a notch by using the Atbash cipher in episodes 7 through 13. The cipher is a monoalphabetic cipher in which the alphabet sequence is reversed, with the last letter becoming the first. For instance, A would be coded as Z, B would be coded as Y, and so on. In the next episodes, 14 through 19, Gravity Falls went a step further and used the A1Z26 cipher. This is a type of encoder and decoder, a substitution cipher, in which each alphabet letter is replaced by a number, 1 through 26. So, in this cipher, A equals 1, B equals 2, C equals 3, all the way to Z equals 26. They are separated by a symbol, like a dash or a space, so that 2 and 6 don't get confused for 26 and so on. Gravity Falls Episode 20 used a combination of all three ciphers, and the keyed Visionaire cipher was used in Episodes 21 through 40, also known as Quagmire the Third. This type of cipher uses an alternate tableau, with the message being encrypted and decrypted by an alphabet key. There's a passphrase involved, which is the code word that chooses columns in the tableau. The alphabet key places a random series of letters before the code letters, which makes the cipher hard to crack. The Shorts of Gravity Falls, known as the Dipper's Guide to the Unexplained, also flash complex ciphers. They're hidden so viewers must look out for them. A little more complicated than little Ralphie's cipher in A Christmas Story, where he works weekly on cracking the code, only to be told to buy some Ovaltine. Some of the secret messages cracked in Gravity Falls are innocent enough, like the passcode in Season 2 Episode 1, which is caught in a jail cell, which decodes to Welcome Back in another episode. The decoded message reads, Mabel eats sprinkles. Another reads, the portal, when completed, will open a gateway to infinite new worlds and herald a new era in mankind's understanding of the universe. Plus, it will probably get girls to start talking to me finally. But others are a little more sinister. A little too sinister for a children's show if you ask me. One decoded message at the end of an episode read, The end of the world is closer than the end of the summer. Well, that's scary. Maybe it's time to build a bomb shelter. YouTuber Lootoons made some great videos on these cryptograms if you're looking to dive deeper. Number 2. What's in a name? The Lion King had plenty of secret messages hidden in its imagery and in its songs. Most of them were pretty naughty, as are a lot of hidden messages in Disney movies, but that's a whole other topic. One secret message in The Lion King has to do with the actual storyline though. The character names in the story were not just chosen at random. The original Lion King, Mufasa, took his name from the last of the Bagata Kings. The name also translates to the word king in the Montezoto language. And his evil brother Scar wasn't really called Scar. This was his nickname due to, of course, the scar he had across his eye. But Scar's real name is Taka. Taka in Swahili means filth or dirt. Sounds about right when describing him. Scar's jealousy and anger led to him taking his own brother's life and trying to take his nephews too in quite a horrible way. Stampeding seems like a pretty dirty, filthy thing to do to someone, but I suppose you could argue that Taka, aka Scar, became who he was because his parents named him thusly. If your parents named you Filth and your brother King, it's safe to say that might have done some serious psychological damage. That's not to say Scar was justified in turning into a homicidal dictator, but it's just something to think about. Before we get to number one, my name is Chills and I hope you're enjoying my narration. If you're curious about what I look like in real life, then go to my Instagram at DylanIsChillinYT and tap that follow button to find out. I'm currently doing a super poll on my Instagram. If you believe ghosts are real, then go to my most recent photo and tap the like button. If you don't, DM me saying why. When you're done, come right back to this video to find out 
out the number one entry. Also, follow me on Twitter at YTChills because that's where I post video updates. It's a proven fact that generosity makes you a happier person, so if you're generous enough to hit that subscribe button and the bell beside it, then thank you. This way, you'll be notified of the new videos we upload every Tuesday and Saturday. Number 1. Bikini Bottom the SpongeBob SquarePants fan theory is the bomb, literally. Some fans think there is a secret message in the name of the show's main setting, Bikini Bottom, which has also been called Bikini Gulch and Bikini Bottomshire. The city's population is around 538, but most of them are total weirdos, so it begs the question, why are they so wide-eyed and weird? Why is this sponge even walking and talking in the first place? Well, one fan theory has tied Bikini Bottom to Bikini Atoll, a real atoll in the Marshall Islands, after the Second World War. For more than a decade starting in 1946, over 20 nuclear devices were detonated in Bikini Atoll, some of which were let off underwater. A bit creepy, but this might explain the mutated characters in Sponge Bob Squarepants and their crazy eyes and even crazier personalities. Sometimes fan theories seem like they could definitely. What is secular humanism? Put simply, secular humanism is an ethical system of beliefs that aspires to the greater good of humanity without the idea of a supreme being or God dictating morals and correct living. It promotes human reasoning and scientific fact as the only way to establish truth. Secular humanism is described as progressive, as ever-changing, due to the changing nature of man and their constant process of proving and disproving the scientific theories that their beliefs are based upon. One famous and commonly quoted motto of the humanist movement is, God is dead. This means that the idea of a god in the age of such thought is no more. It has been disproven and is no longer a valid theory. Secular humanism is a very appealing religion or worldview because of its scientific approach to all of its beliefs and its purpose to give factual answers to all questions. Knowledge is obtained through observation, experimentation, and rational analysis. Through science, Humanists are searching for a good code of ethics to follow, and they think that with logic, ideas, goodwill, and tolerance, we can make the world a better place. Ethics are based on the human experience of the individual. The situations a person goes through and the people a person encounters throughout life influence and define what is right and what is wrong for that person. Morality is biological and situational instead of theological. Man is innately good and our social instincts and the human experience over centuries of time form the basis of morality. Humanists say there is no life after death. The end of life is what makes it so precious and valuable because this brief life is the only chance we have to fulfill our purposes and roles in life. Our purpose is to make the best of every moment we obtain here on earth focus solely on the here and now, and to seek the betterment of ourselves, others, and society. There are three key beliefs of secular humanists. The first is materialism, which is the belief that only the material world exists, only the physical world that can it be experienced through the senses. There is no supernatural or metaphysical. The second is naturalism, which is the belief that everything can be explained through natural processes such as evolution. The third is relativism, which is the belief that knowledge, truth, and morality exist in relation to culture, society, or historical context. Nothing is absolute. Not only is our culture influenced, but also secular government, which runs along rational and humanistic lines. This is the norm that has evolved in a multicultural world. Every person has the freedom to believe in whatever worldview he chooses. Because of this freedom of religion, our modern government felt compelled to build a wall of separation between church and state to avoid resentment or division between the government and its people. However, this humanistic wall is contrary to the Founding Fathers' intent. This separation has caused the apples 
absolute moral code to be removed from the government policies and cause the government to become an anti-religious police force infringing on the individual's right to freedom of religion. The Founding Fathers expressed in our Declaration of Independence and Constitution that all men are created equal with unalienable rights, including the freedom of religion, and that the government was never to intrude upon that freedom. We as Christians should reject this worldview of secular humanism. The humanist argument can be refuted with the same scientific reproach that they claim to use to find truth. For example, creation points to God's existence that there was an intelligent design to the entire universe. Man has proven himself time and time again to live for self and not for the betterment of society as a whole. That when given the choice, he will choose what feels right to him and not necessarily take into consideration what might be right to someone else. Secular humanists feel mankind is innately good and will seek the best for everyone. But the Bible teaches us that man is sinful by nature from the moment of birth and therefore selfish. The only way to escape this state is through the redemption of God. SpongeBob SquarePants, the wildly popular Nickelodeon cartoon. Why? Well, it turns out a new study by child psychologists suggests that cheerful, can-do little sponge could threaten your child's development. The psychologists set out to measure how the cartoon affects the cognitive capability and impulse control of children who watch it. ABC's Neil Karlinski tonight tells us what the study discovered and what Nickelodeon has to say about it. Who lives in a pineapple under the sea? Until now, everyone's favorite nonsensical yellow sponge who lives under the sea has had only one main enemy. <laughs> Plankton, that tiny little guy with the deep voice and relentless spirit. The Krusty Krab is mine! Today, SpongeBob has another nemesis, University of Virginia psychologist Angeline Lillard. She says the show SpongeBob SquarePants may be harming America's preschoolers. Her study found that after nine minutes of SpongeBob, kids couldn't concentrate, think clearly, or learn as well. I'm cool. This is no ordinary show. SpongeBob is one of the most popular children's shows ever. We went behind the scenes with them last year to meet the faces behind the fish. Oh, somebody's ten. Krusty Krab, Krusty Krab, come on down to the Krusty Krab! <laughs> the new study doesn't say there's anything wrong with the subject matter, a silly table sponge and his dopey friend Patrick, Squidward, Mr. Krabs and the gang, but it does say the frantic pacing, scene changes every 11 seconds on average, often leaves kids zoned out and spun up, unable to concentrate. We watched Spongebob with an expert in child behavior to see what he thought. So what do you say to those parents who, who look at this study and say, come on, I mean, seriously, this is Spongebob. I don't think that anybody, including the makers of Spongebob, argue this show is educational. It's clearly meant for entertainment. And I'll admit, it's very entertaining. I've seen many an episode myself. But what it tells us is the kids that watch that versus the kids that watch something else uh, are at least at risk for having short and long-term uh, performance deficits. The study looked at four-year-olds and compared them with kids watching a decidedly slower-paced show, Caillou. Well, I think we're all done shopping. <laughs> The Caillou kids weren't as easily distracted after the show. Oh, that's right. But the SpongeBob team says this isn't a valid study because their show is meant for kids six and up. SpongeBob. SpongeBob is not designed to educate preschoolers. It's designed to entertain. I will not let you down. And that's not their only problem with it. There are not enough children included in this study. Uh, parents were asked to report on their own children and we work with parents every day and we see how much they love their kids. They're going to tell us their kids are great. SpongeBob isn't the first children's show to go under the microscope. Meep, meep. Years ago, researchers said the Roadrunner and Coyote made kids more violent. The Reverend Jerry Falwell called a Teletubby named Tinky Winky a gay role model. They're Making a clever. children's show isn't child's play, and the people who bring SpongeBob to life are acutely aware of the critics. 
In script meetings, potentially offensive words or themes are cut out. Keep an eye out for also how angry SpongeBob seems, because one of the nice things about his role in this is that he's really trying to be polite and respectful. Tom Kenny, SpongeBob SquarePants. The humans who give voice to the eclectic gang of characters told us they've heard it all before. I think there is an impression among people who haven't watched the show a lot, maybe, that, um, you know, it's teaching the kids bad habits to, to call each other stupid or dumb dumb, mm -hmm. you know, or maybe, you know, hit somebody on the head. I think a lot of people are very careful about television and are very super careful about introducing their kids to television because it can consume young people. <laughs> there are a few children's shows that go out of their way to engage kids, like Sesame Street and Dora the Explorer, which encourage kids to answer questions and interact with the story. The researchers don't take issue with those shows, but for some, they're not nearly as entertaining. Those cartoons that are supposed to be good for your kids? Boring! Oh, yeah. <laughs> They're a tough slog, believe me. So what's a parent to do? I don't think parents should be unduly alarmed. The effects here were short-lived in all probability. The man behind the sponge says you might want to keep in mind that the show isn't intended to be educational, and parents aren't supposed to just let young kids zone out all by themselves. I miss the days when uh, parents didn't care that much. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like I mean, wow! If there were watchdog groups around then, that you know, I, I would have no Popeye in my life, no Three Stooges, no Looney Tunes. Okay. Yeah, you know, yeah, none of this, so none of the so stuff so that sort of no informed my sensibility. I'm Neil Karlinski for Nightline in Seattle. They are some of the most popular and flashy TV evangelists in the country. These men appear to have made a lot of money, and they travel, well, like kings. When our Lisa Guerrero tried to ask one of these wealthy preachers about that, some might say she was treated in a very non-Christian way. There ought not be any poor among you. They're among the most popular televangelists in America. I just need more. I just need more. And they're wealthy beyond imagination. One of my chandeliers costs more than most people's house. I got 22 chandeliers in the house. They live in huge mansions drive fancy cars, and forget about flying coach. They own some of the best private jets money can buy. I got an intercontinental plane. Pastor Jesse DePlantis zips around in this DeSalt Falcon 50 jet paid for by his church. Here he is boarding the plane with his wife for a short one hour flight from Fort Worth, Texas to his home outside New Orleans. Estimated round trip cost? $14,000. If he flew commercial, it would be as low as 180 bucks. My congregation is the world. I need to play. He says his jet allows him to better spread his message around the world, and it sure has taken him to some pretty nice places. 16 times to Hawaii alone since 2006. I really believe that if Jesus was physically on the earth today, he wouldn't be riding a donkey. DePlantis now wants an upgrade to this $54 million DeSalt 7X that comes with lavish interiors. Only the wealthiest people in the world can afford such luxury. So for you that don't think I should have that plane, God told me to have that plane. When he didn't respond to our request for an interview, I met him at a book signing. Why do you need a $54 million private jet? We're not doing any kind of interviews right now. I'm in a book. I just like to know why you need a private Keep your hands off me. Why are your people touching me like this? Because you need to Let go of me. The next day, back on the pulpit, he joked about how his security got rid of me. She gone. Boom. I can hear her hollering. <laughs> And I came back and said, what'd you do with her? He said, I made her outside edition. For $54 million, I want you to imagine how many people could be fed, how many homeless could have places to sleep. Ole Anthony and Pete Evans investigate televangelists for the Trinity Foundation, a watchdog group. They're extremely greedy. They don't need mansions. They don't need jets. Ha, 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 ha. But when it comes to luxurious travel... Are you seeing this? I hope so. You bought it. <laughs> very few people can beat Kenneth Copeland. He even has his own airport next to his lovely mansion in Newark, Texas. Copeland actually has two private jets. 
a $20 million Citation 10, and a Gulfstream 5 jet that he recently bought from movie director Tyler Perry. He's flown his jets to his vacation ski resort in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, at least 143 times since 2000. So why not fly coach? Who better to explain his reasoning than to that other high-flying preacher, his good buddy Jesse DePlantis? This dope-filled world, right. and get in an air, get in a long tube with a bunch of demons. Right, that's exactly the And it, it's deadly. We caught up with Reverend Copeland in Branson, Missouri. You said that you don't like to fly commercial because you don't want to get into a tube with a bunch of demons. Do you really believe that human beings are demons? No, I do not. And don't you ever say I did. If I flew commercial, I'd have to stop 65% of what I'm doing. How much money did you pay for Tyler Perry's Gulfstream jet, for example? Well, for example, that's really none of your business, but... Isn't it the business of your donors? Listen, he made that airplane so cheap for me, I couldn't help but buy it. It's impossible to know exactly how many millions of dollars these ministries take in every year because they are not required to make financial disclosures of donations received.